space is supporting or enabling a number of the SDGs that you, you mentioned. I mean, we have 17. There are proposals for even having space as the 18th SDG. Are there various activities and initiatives out there to, to bring that to the table? Because we are so heavily depending on it and we have to clarify or we, we have to set our rule uh, our rules to yeah not make a mistake that we will regret sooner or later because i mean you mentioned this is the space junk or or um, this is the space debris um we have the situation with the oceans and then it's it's not that extreme but or uh, i mean we over years over over decades we polluted the the oceans and now we surprisingly are see that even the fish that we are catching from the sea has the microplastics and it has an effect in the entire our circle or on the ocean so also we have these massive islands and i don't know what the size is now are of, of garbage which are just there and i mean that is absolutely frightening and we start to do that it's the same in in space <laughs> Boston Cleaning is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine, publisher of Space Watch Global, a Thor Group GmbH brand. Boston is the CEO and is a business development executive with an academic and professional experience in space management, satellite communications, and broadcast technology. He has an electrical and telecommunications engineering background and studied information technology and computer science at the Technical College of Berlin. Thorsten began his career as a software developer before moving into sales management and business development working at companies including 3Com, Lucent Digital, Video, SES, Astra, Bertelsmann, and PTS Scientists. A proud Berliner with a global outlook, Thorsten expanded his horizons even further by attending the International Space University and earning an executive MBA. His ISU thesis analyzed capacity building visions and opportunities of countries in the Gulf region, and he brings experience developing strong and lasting business relationships with Middle Eastern countries. At Spacewatch Global, Torsten is putting his business acumen to good use in his operations and business development role, specializing in international partnerships and information analysis. He has been instrumental in, in successfully identifying new market opportunities and takes pride in building strong customer relationships that benefit all partners, combining his business intelligence with an ability to understand complex technical information from the market and clients. Since the beginning of 2020, he hosts a series of space cafes virtually, his weekly space cafe web talk, 33 minutes with different um, guests. He hosts high-level actors in the space community for an in-depth talk. He also produces the bi-weekly Space Cafe podcast hosted by Marcus Muslechner. In 2021, the Space Cafes branched uh, out to various regions of the world. Thorsten, Thank you for giving me the short bio because I know it could be much longer because you've been doing this for quite some time. You have a plethora of background. Welcome to the show. Mark, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And although I always say when you have an extensive bio, then you're just being old. Experience, let's put it that way. We all are experienced. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely old, but um, no, you, you've just got a plethora of experience and it's so nice. We, our paths have crossed many times. We know each other from MLove, Future.io, uh, Kinternet, uh, H Farm, many, many other locations. The last time we saw each other live was at DLD in Munich at uh, uh, um, 2020. So yeah. before the pandemic really 
hit and got underway. And uh, we had a, had a nice talk there. You had a nice, uh, I, I don't know, as a plan area panel discussion uh, there at DLD, which was beautiful and um, uh, did some fabulous things. So I, I want to jump right into it. So we have been through hell. We've experienced the COVID, the pandemic, all this craziness, all your years of experience, all, all uh, what you've done, what you've learned kind of with this strong focus on, on space, the future innovations that are really, really meant to bring us into better futures and get us out of crazy situations like this in some respects, if you drill down to it. How have you weathered this time? Did you have any resilience? Tell me your personal experiences and aha moments during this time that's a that's a that's a big question but um yeah i mean i think what we experience right now to overcoming the pandemic are is a good use of space technology are um, in our daily life um i mean that we talk here together are in this or in this setup i wouldn't say it's something that that comes from space, not at all. It's, event, or it's, it's in, invented here on Earth, but it has strong sales components in it. So the entire um, timing for, for most of the services we use comes from, from space. So, and how did we do? Uh, I mean, we run in a digital platform um, and we, we see an, a, a rising moment in the in pandemic because people stay home but there's still a hunger to know what's going on and i think also we see that as a hunger for higher quality information not the usual one that you get from the from the yellow press uh, sure that's something that that most people need also to digest but yes and that's what we particularly see are a hunger for high quality information and or also interactive formats. I mean, like what, what, what we do right now, people like to consume with all their senses, whatever is possible. I mean, the only thing what we miss at the moment is to, to hug each other, to, to have a drink or, or next to each other and, and experience the, this kind of social life. But all the rest, I think um, we, we can feed that white quite well. So yeah we are surviving in this environment in the with the pandemic and i mean germany is heading now the third lockdown or so i mean it's obviously not avoidable or um, so um yeah we will see how long that will take but satellite satellite technology the use of satellites the protection of assets in in in, in space is something um we are big advocates for I want to drill down even deeper. You personally, where you, did you have to make any pivots um, a, as we got into the first lockdown, into the pandemic to kind of move forward? And is that how some of uh, Space Cafe and Space Watch yeah. emerged? Or uh, were, were you totally prepared? You were saying, oh, I've done this for years and we could go. I just want to dive even deeper and kind of pull out what's happened with you and what some okay. of the great successes even though we were in a pandemic? Oh, um, great point. And no, I didn't have a, blue plan, a blueprint for, for that, uh, to be honest. So I just uh, adapted to the situation and, and made the best out of it. And I mean, as you mentioned before, we have seen each other over the, or in the course of the last years with, or on so many occasions and so many places of the world, I was a frequent traveler. And uh, the last year, was the first year after the wall came down. Uh, so for those that want to calculate back, it's quite a while ago. Um, so it's the first year that I haven't taken a single flight. And I have to say, hey, I'm still alive. And sure, you have to rethink about all this travel arrangement before and yeah, mirror that a bit. Or, um, but the question was, so how did we manage uh, with that? Um, the space cafes was a physical interaction with people or we had or twice in Berlin before. Um, and we said, Hey, why don't we get it online? Because we arranged our, um, an, a nice contract or a nice setting beginning of last year with a big telecom operator here in Germany to use their facility in Berlin to, to um, offer these space cafes uh, a few times a week. And then 
pandemic hit us. So we said, do we stop now? Do we wait until it's over? But hey, when will that happen? So nobody had an idea. And we said, nope, we just go online like everyone else. But then we, you can't take physical formats one to one into online formats because, I mean, we all are Zoomified or over the last year with two hour and beyond panels with dozens of people where even as a panelist, you're bored to death because your FaceTime is limited to three minutes, but then you have to sit two hours in front of a camera with smiling and you can't do anything else than being there. So, and I think um, we have to adapt with this new uh, situation and find formats that are exciting for people and are engaging at the same time. So, I mean, you know what happened when you have 100 people in a Zoom room and try to interact with them and everybody can can speak or it, it doesn't work. Yeah. So the format we have developed or sort of was a short format, 33 minutes, in-depth talk with somebody um, on a topic my guest is interested in. And what I always say is I'm inviting my guest to my virtually to my terrace to have a drink, have a conversation on a space topic, what is close to his or her heart, and then dive into that. And we let our audience participate in that and then interacting with us with sending in their questions and then we we take our them them into it but 33 minutes it is not longer so and that's obviously pretty appealing for for people and um i mean we run now over 50 shows or uh, i mean yeah we run it for a year now weekly so over 50 shows and uh yeah well recognized that's great that's great to hear i'm glad to hear it um i, I want to know a little bit more too because i um i do a, a um a show on clubhouse every tuesday evening around around food and i wanted to find out i've seen you there you're also doing a, a, i think it's a form of either mm -hmm. space cafe or space watch what what are you finding about that new platform and how is that going is there a lot of uh space enthusiasts or people on clubhouse that are interested in these topics absolutely um i mean it's a it's a these are the new kids on the block yeah uh, i mean it's something um what appeared last year and obviously made its way uh, through the through, through through the world and i mean we skipped TikTok. I still don't know how to use it and what it's for, but however, I have a hard time to understand uh, the use of, of, of Instagram, but okay. Um, and Clubhouse, I said, yeah, that looks pretty interesting because um, it's, it's audio only, it's not recorded. So, and you have an interaction uh, with people and what we do, and you pointed to that, are uh, after our 33 minutes, we do an extra 33 minutes, and that's actually also how we call it, Space Cafe, an extra 33 minutes on Clubhouse to either engage with our uh, guests or uh, to engage with the audience, what they think about it, if they have other questions. And so, because it's a more informal talk than we have it on, on, the, the, on, our, on Zoom, our, um, because we also record our, our talks or our uh, dialogues and and archive them and make them available for 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 later usage and on clubhouse it's it's fluid it's it's gone when it's set and there are definitely a number of of our space people are on the are on on clubhouse are there i mean every day ongoing space discussions are on on various levels and it also open us to a new audience um, and that's that's an interesting side effect so i mean we all have this, this the point of hey how do we engage with new with more people with new people with other people our followership is great and we have two thirds of people that are coming back to our space cafes yeah after they have been there they, they're coming back or, and they are on, on the list to to get the next announcement and all of that but how to engage with new ones how to do the next leap how to really uh exponential grow and i think clubhouse uh, is for us at the moment an experiment i mean it's we're doing it just on somebody else platform that's also something you have to yeah. take into account and it's not there forever 
So it's it's for the moment, and it is good to communicate with people. But uh, at the moment, I think from a business point of view, we all are have the same question marks in our eyes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to kind of go in a little bit more on um, is is it all in English? Is it mixed between German and English, or both Space Watch and Space Cafe? Um, for I mean, for space, the universal language is, is English, or without any doubt. So we publish our, on our website everything in English. I mean, we we started at one stage with with a Russian section that didn't turn out that well. Maybe we've been too early. Um, uh, but on on Clubhouse, we do it all in in English. Also, the space cafes are the space cafe thirty three minutes are in English. Um, we started uh, earlier this year with as you as you mentioned earlier branching out the space cafes into the regions so um australia brazil uh germany netherlands is coming up or russia and these are in local languages and why are we doing it we want to do something for the community in these countries because if we talk about global space it is important no doubt because space is not something you can divide for country by country. Um, so we need this global dialogue, but we also need to address um, the people in the countries that might not be able to speak English. So for instance, the Space Cafe Russia is in Russian. So Elena Morozova, um, she's the executive secretary of um, Inter Sputnik. She is hosting guests and her first guest, Olga Volinskaya, uh, is a space lawyer. And so the, they spoke about the application of space law in Russia, in Russian. And it was a huge success. I mean, I try to understand what they're talking. What's very was hard for me. Yeah. Or, um, I, I couldn't catch up with it. But um, I mean, we got absolute positive feedback. And we do it the same with, in Portuguese, in Brazil. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, Canada is coming up. Scotland, UK is all in English. Even in the Netherlands um, will be in, in English. Germany we have done in German because we have a huge uh, community in Germany that is also not able to speak English or a proper English. So we hosted, uh, or our host uh, for Germany, Andreas Schepers, hosted uh, Dr. Walter Pelzer, the head of the DLR. Um, and they spoke uh, about space, new space, launchers, micro launchers, North Sea, and so on in German to a German audience. So I want to um, I want to get into a couple of things now that you've brought that up the the international communities. And I want to focus in on two areas and see you know what what you've heard or what what you because you have your finger on the pulse and what you've heard of or uh, observed. First of all, Russia with the uh, now you know pretty much the the U.S. space race with Tesla and Virgin Galactic and 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 the others, Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, has pretty much gone over to the privatization. Uh, NASA's given the contract to Musk, and, and that how has that affected the Sputnik program, Russia? What 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 is their next phase? What is their future? Are they collaborating? Is that is that something because they were the ones just up until recent, taking us up to the space station. So I'd like to know what, what kind of insights, what's the future for them and, and how that's affected them from what you you found out so far. Absolutely. And um, I have to say, after the Sputnik program, many things happened also in Russia. So, uh, I mean, Russia went through massive uh, changes in the entire structure. So are the, the departure of the um, U USSR. Uh, now we have the sovereign countries um, there. A lot of the space technology uh, is more or less divided by um, Ukraine, Russia, and Kazakhstan. So, and um, that is also, that I mean, also the, the, the conflict obviously between Russia and, uh, and Ukraine causes a number of, of challenges in the in the Russian space program. So, um, but what we see is that Russia is delivering a service and Russia is doing their stuff. Yes, the, the Soyuz rocket is technology, or I think, which is 30 years proven, uh, but it's doing the job. So um, how the future will look like, we will see. Uh, I mean, the, the new alliance is, and you might have seen that, 
or there's an MOU or under or, or uh, underwritten by China and and Russia about space exploration. So that could be an interesting, if you want, my say, may say, frightening new development. But um, definitely, we will see two blocks, at least two blocks, or even in our space development. And there's no doubt that the U.S. government, military, private, is uh, in the lead position. Yeah? But uh, others will come. And um, I would say at the moment, Russia is doing their job, slow pace. I mean, all the budgets are, are down there as, as, as well. Um, they have huge challenges on the and the economics or and that influence the, the space program as well. But who we see is is rising at the moment dramatically uh, is China. Yeah? I mean, we cooperate with um, folks in China to get news, independent news from China. And uh, just today, uh, there was a huge announcement about a huge funding round for uh, a new constellation from China on narrowband or communication. So these things are happening are right now. So we see a lot of also Russian technology is emerging or giving a base for the Chinese development or in, 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 in space. And even so, China is not that far advanced or it is on a way and on a very fast, fast track right now. Yeah, I think uh, good, bad, or ugly, China's uh, handing us our asses uh, in many different ways. They're really showing us some examples in, in all different sectors. Uh, the other community that I wanted to, to discuss is India. So India did a launch and, and at, uh, right before touchdown or during the touchdown process, lost communications. And, and then afterwards, not much was heard of. But... <clears throat> It was a huge milestone. It was a huge uh, thing for, for India as well to, to even get that far and to have that kind of a success to that. And, and a lot of missions fail. So, I mean, uh, it's not saying anything that it, that it failed because there's many missions, even with Musk, that, that fail or, or they're learning, chalk it up to learning experience. Um, what do you know about that community and the, the, the failures there are some things that maybe is there any discussions going on with that and, and the advancements there in India? Absolutely. Um, I mean, you were referring to their moon landers or and as mm -hmm. a moon program are, I mean, we have seen that these is a private or, or a initiative called or um, emerging from the Google Lunar X Prize. So, Mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, namely, um, Israel, the Bereshit lander, who are uh, smashed on the. Oh, they had a hard touchdown on the on the lunar yeah. surface, uh, which was a bit unfortunate. And then, or uh, shortly after, uh, we have seen Ch um, India's government or Israel mission also not make it or uh, softly on the moon. So, um, but there there will be in both countries new um, new missions and and Ch um, India also um, going for a uh, human space flight now with their own program. Our India opened slowly in the Indian style, very slow to, uh, to, commercialize, to, to commercialize the market. So we see at the moment a high number of, of Indian startups in the, in the space sector, also raising foreign money, money for, the, uh, for, for them. I mean, Pixar, is, is, is oh no pixel not pixar uh, with double pixel, x yeah. um pixel is is one one of them i mean there's a huge community or uh, new space india called um and um uh, it's worth to watch what comes out from there and i mean we know the indian education system is is quite well advanced i mean they have two million graduates every year coming out from the from the universities on on it or 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 or, or with IT or studies. So, I mean, and they are, they are going globally and then also coming back with bringing this knowledge home. And so there's nothing wrong with, with that. Yeah. Um, but uh, India is also to watch or in that, in that they have launch cap capacities. They showed, unfortunately, uh, I mean, they showed the 
are the, the ASOS, the anti-satellite capabilities, or two years back where they shoot down one of their own satellites. Um, but I mean, India is operating also in a very geopolitical, very sensitive area. Uh, I mean, there are permanent conflicts with Pakistan. There's this tension with China in, 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 in the north of, of, of India. And I mean, in, we have to see all these circumstances to understand why there was this timing for an, an ASA test. Now, even it, it, it created unnecessary debris and, and all, all of that, what came, came with it. And I mean, these the scientists are, I mean, we were told, the press were told, oh, that was not a problem. It was such a low orbit that will deorbit de within months. Yeah, a few years later, still we have um, fragments and objects are still in, in space. And that's one of the things that is very um, alarming. And you mentioned earlier the DLD uh, in, in Munich earlier last year, um, where we had a panel on, on space situational awareness, space debris, to, to raise this awareness here on Earth that we are so heavily depending on space assets and the services we are getting from space that we can't risk these assets and sure the military has a different point on on on, on that to take are uh, but all the commercial services weather earth observation i mean all of that wouldn't be possible with without um the assets in space plus positioning services i mean yeah are you able are you still able to 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 read a map if you've seen it i mean we are old enough we had we had learned it and we have been yeah. potentially boy scouts or in the army to to train it or and couldn't navigate but i mean who of the, the young generation is able to to read a map uh, yeah yeah it's, it's and it's, why uh, <laughs> yeah. because exactly. hey i'm i'm this blue dot here moving so so there's a couple of points that you brought up that I want to even go a little bit deeper into. And uh, if they're touchy subjects, you just tell me. So uh, first of all, you have engineering background and computer science degree. I, I do as well. But you, what's really interesting is the International Space University, your uh, executive MBA that you have through there. With this type of almost moonshot degree or outer space thinking, there's a lot of, uh, of forecasting. There's also a lot of planning, uh, road mapping and future planning. Okay, how do we build something, engineer something? What's the science, the math to get us to this point, which is a time in the future, actually. It's, you know, it's a roadmap timeline plan to get us there, which all, you know, whether it's private whether it's India, whether it's Sputnik, it's Russia, it's whoever it is, they're all doing these things that are really, especially the, the great things that have happened with Mars lately, they're all, you know, many months, much planning and adjustments along the way. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's, I mean, that's the tools and the business model or the, the way to think to get there. But now I want to go into the hard question. On the ground, a lot of these private companies or, or these programs, we, we talked about India and the moon mm -hmm. landing, you were involved in, in PT scientists, which stands for part-time scientists. Uh, wonderful thing, we, uh, I saw, saw the, um, the lander, the rover uh, uh, at uh, H Farm, and we, we've talked about it before. Um, I, I guess you could say great partners or great collaborations. But there's almost a bastardization or something where it goes wrong along the way with when we when we get into some of these people want to put their logo or their brand on things and, and the true reason of what you want to do or what you want to accomplish kind of gets in the way and, and um, first of all I would just you know if you don't mind tell us about the beautiful, wonderful things about PT scientists and how you got involved and started with that. And then also why you decided this is not right. It's too, there's something wrong here, which we're, we're not just seeing with PT scientists, we're seeing in other areas as well. No, uh, no problem at all. Uh, I mean, PT scientists is part of my, my own history and heritage. So, uh, and that's not something I, I regret, definitely not because um, it, it was a cool thing, and I will talk about it in a, in a second. So, um, how, 
what what was PT scientist, PTS, part-time scientist, as you uh, as you mentioned. So um, they were one of the teams or uh, that were participating in the Google Lunar X Prize. And the Google Lunar X Prize was to recalculate, I think, set up 12, 14 years ago, something like yeah. that. 2007, 2007. So it was 14 years ago, yeah. Um, by, by Peter Diamandis uh, and, and his team, and they got Google on board. And that was an X Prize following the um, Ansari X Prize, where we had seen the first commercial companies going to suborbital, or um, Virgin Galactic uh, and, and X Core and, and all of those. Um, so the next one was then the literal the moonshot. So uh, the X Prize was fly privately to the moon, or um, have a vehicle with you, or un uh, uncrewed, or have a vehicle with you, drive 500 meters, send an HD video back, and I think an eight minute HD video back, and you will get what's it, 10 million or $20 million for that. So, I mean, if somebody offers you 10 million or $20 million, um, you, I think that's, that's an amount for both of us that is, wow, wow, that's a lot. If you do a moonshot, hmm, you know, or it might uh, leverage a bit. So, I mean, how does it cost to fly something to the moon? Or uh, definitely more than 20 million. I mean, that's without spoiling, um, that's what I can say. So, but at least it, it was a drive. And what, it, what happened is that I think 35, 37 teams worldwide came together and were in this race, starting with rovers, starting with landers, so, and what we see today, we have a number of le leftovers or emerging companies out, out of these or uh, out of this team. So one of them was PT Scientist in Berlin, uh, run uh, and, and, and founded by, by Robert Böhmer and his team. And um, yeah, they created also an, a great partnership with Audi um, so that the rover was then uh, rebranded in the Audi Luna Quadro to have to bring the four rings to the moon. And uh, what you have seen was one of the models or uh, we built, um, we cr built a spacecraft or uh, called, um, or what build, we designed a spacecraft called Alina, uh, autonomous landing and navigation or uh, module to fly to the moon, to land and to also have payload. And payload means really um, other people, other companies, other organizations are experiment and stuff to the moon. So we also worked with companies like Vodafone, uh, Red Bull um, and Omega and so on. And that was a great experience. And they approached me um, because I've done a lot of uh, business and, 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 and work in the Middle East uh, with, with their space programs and their initiatives. And so at one of their trips to the Middle East, they approached me if I could help them. And so I uh, jumped on a plane, uh, went with them to Doha at that point of time. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. They asked me to, to uh, come on board and work with them. And then I ended up to being their chief commercial officer and afterwards chief business officer, which was a great time. But um, I also learned then that moonshots are not, we can't take moonshots for granted. I mean, um, you need an idea, you need a bold vision. I mean, Elon Musk, is, I think, is the, is, the, is the anchor that we all have seen or the role model we all have seen here. I mean, the Falcon 1 failed um, and uh, then he, after three uh, failures, he came up with a contract or uh, with, with the US or uh, Air Force, created the Falcon 9, and he succeeded. I mean, also with, with a number of their, uh, his, his um, uh, innovations, like reusing first stages, which was impossible to imagine for the established agencies and the established players. I mean, I'm old enough in this, or long enough in this market to have been in this, in this panels that, that people say, no, that doesn't work, never, ever, we can do that. And so, and that doesn't make sense. I mean, Elon has proven us all wrong yeah, for these ideas. I mean, yeah, he failed for the first three, whatever landings, even, I mean, I think earlier this year, he failed a landing of, of, of a booster, but so what? I mean, he, he, 
he landed, or I think 50 of them in the bullseye uh, already. And yes, what we see right now are these, these enormous speed with the Starship development. Yes, their hopping tests are not successful. And I mean, the last one landed and then exploded shortly after, what is also not cool. Uh, but I mean, it's just a matter of time. And I think SN10, 11, whatever, is on the rollout already. So he building it in an incredible fast uh, cycle. And what we, what we learned from that is that these things are possible, that you need something and that's money, resources, you need the talents, you need the right partners. And for PT scientists, it didn't work out. So, and then uh, there was an insolvency uh, coming and I said, I have to move on. I mean, it's, it, it, I've, I can't stay that uh, any, any longer. And so, uh, I, yeah. It's, def it's found... definitely a hard area to be in, but I think that it was, was there anything with like, uh, you know, these, these logo placements or anything with like, you know, you, you thought you had people on board that were supportive, but it's really wasn't enough funding to get you to where you need to be or enough drive to stick with that full amount of time, that really truly future vision of, of, of where it needs to go or could, can you put your finger on anything or, or you, you think that's a, a you're, you're glad to be moved on and you don't want to talk about anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, these are questions that I ask myself. I mean, are a, with these were questions I asked myself while I then departed um, and also still are retrospective. So are, why didn't we succeed? And why do we see today um, companies like uh, Astrobotic or so are a competitor in this market or in this in this race earlier is not surviving. I wouldn't say succeeding even, but succeeding in, in terms of they raised money uh, from from NASA, they um, they got access to to technology to really to the helping hand and the resources to make that possible. I mean, we see at the moment, I think three or four companies, iSpace included from Japan, also now moving to the US, open an office there. Um, we have dynamic, dy intuitive machine. Um, so they all, and of course, Team America um, led by, by Blue, Blue Origin yeah. that, that are heading to the moon. So, but they all are take off Blue Origin or from, from that equation, but all the others, they need the funds from NASA and they and NASA are dedicated a program called CLIPS Commercial Lunar Payload Services worth I think 2.6 billion dollar to with the, with the last administration to the uh, to the moonshots to going back to the moon are and to stay are also as commercial entities and Europe wasn't there at that point of time and it's still not yeah I mean if you see the investment situation in terms of, of space in Europe, or particular in Germany, then when you go to somebody and say, hey, we want to build an infrastructure on a, on a moon and that is in our telecommunication network or a, a power network or so on, um, I would say questioning look or views or looks are the least what you can earn from it. I mean, you know that you go out and talk how to make this world a better place and people say, yeah, but wow, that's a bold idea. And then, uh, yeah, I, I can't go further into the details and I, I don't want, uh, but um, I've taken for me the decision to say, it's time to, time to move on. It's to... a beautiful learning lesson, definitely. Oh yes, I, oh yeah. I, I, I and so much knowledge and growth out of it. And, uh, but there's also, I mean, uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm two, three times removed from, from anything that you're involved in, but I, I, I see it with a different lens. I also see, you know, the big commercialization. I see the branding, the logos, I see the, the prizes, whether it's the X prize or other prizes out there that are pushing for new innovations and drives and collaboration. 
that those monies that they give in the prizes are just a tickle a fraction of what's actually needed to, to, to get there. And so that there is still this whole separate thing that has nothing to do with, uh, with getting to space, with getting anything landed, that is, is a whole machine in and of itself of raising money and continually keeping that cash flow so that the company can focus in on its R and D, on its innovation, getting the, the getting the projects to space. So, my hats off to you, and and um, I was always pulling for you. I'm I'm glad you moved on and found other other ways, and now you're meeting with all the the great people and and having wonderful uh, conversations. So, Space Watch Global is this digital magazine and portal for those interested in space and far-reaching impact space development has on our world. Um, in, in that, I, I'm sure you get to talk to the, the superstars and get the great insights, but do you go a little bit further and actually get into the nitty gritty? Where are the systemic problems? Where are the futures going? Where, where you know, uh, not just, oh, we've got the super, superstar here, just came back from ISS space station or whatever, and, and, and it's the only the, the starstruck type of conversations. Do you, what would you say out of all your 50 talks that you've had, um, would you say, wow, that was enlightening, so something that I just didn't know was going to come and, and, and out, out of these conversations that I said, that's that you've got to listen to that as something that changes your view on the space uh, uh, race or the space okay. watch period. Absolutely. And I mean, all of these, these talks that we, we had or every single one is, is for me on this level to say, wow, worth to listen. I mean, yeah, 50 times 30 minutes is are a severe amount of, of time that you have to spend or to, to listen to all of them, but are, they all had to say or had to say something. So, um, but to back to your point, we are definitely not cheerleaders for one of the big innovators or we have in this in this market. The first thing what differentiates us as a as a platform as a magazine is we are Switzerland based, we are per se independent and neutral. So we are not following um, a specific market or, or a specific agenda or of, of a country, a nation, an institution. So our, um, that is absolute important to, to, to mention because with this independence, we also have the, the liberty to have a separate view on things. So we are at advocating at the moment a lot for our space situational awareness, or space traffic management, for regulations and um, implementation of, of rules and laws on, on the international level. I mean, we have the Outer Space Treaty that, that rules our behavior in space, but then when you come to the details, then I wouldn't say it's weak, but it, it didn't have the foresight to implement all of these things are that are needed today i mean good example last year um yeah last year no two years back the un copius that is the uh, the committee of the peaceful use of outer space um and has 95 countries are in in, in copius right now um copius came up with the adaptation of 25 LTS long-term sustainability guidelines for behavior in outer space. What does it mean? I'm not interfering with somebody. I'm um, I'm I'm deorbiting my stuff when it's when it's not used anymore, and so on and so forth. So it goes in and really in, in big details. This, the adaptation of the 21 guidelines took 10 years. I would say we don't have these 10 years to implement them anymore, and the implementation is obviously then nation. Um, are the nation's um, obligation. Are they doing it? Are they implementing all? Just a few of them. So there is no rule set for that. And I mean, look at Europe. We have in Europe a few uh, countries which are having assets in space, does not have a space law, including Germany. Um, also the space laws and the space policies in the various countries in Europe are differentiate from each other. So in Luxembourg, 
or, or under the Luxembourgish law, you can appropriate um, uh, resources um, in outer space. So in others you can't because many of us think it, it, it violates the outer space treaty. All of that is not clear. I mean, at the moment we are debating um, and that's definitely something where I say, we are not cheerleaders. Um, we're seeing Star Starlink launching or SpaceX launching the Starlink fleet are almost every second week. So that means we count at the moment 1300 Starlink satellites in space, which is it's over one third of the active satellites that we have held in one man's hand. So, and how many satellites does does it need to make one Close specific 12, orbit? Twelve thousand for uh, Starlink. I think they were. That's that's for, for, that's for, uh, that's forecasted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but even with the with the almost thousand, uh, I mean. If you want to place your satellite in a specific orbit and this orbit is taken without, I mean, you can't appropriate an orbit, but if you put your fleet up there, it's taken by definition. So, um, and that causes a lot of harm or for, for others. I mean, we have all these assets in space and I mean, imagine we will depend or, I mean, we spoke about cyber threats or the last week um, in, in my space cafe with one of the experts, Jose Ashash. From, from Switzerland. And we spoke about internet from space. Why, why do we need it? I mean, we have, I mean, in most cities we have a wired connection or we have a great mobile network, which is capable. But what all of these lacking are rural areas and, and um, wider areas as well. So, and we need it for autonomous driving, autonomous vehicle, not just driving, everything are what, what will move autonomous. So we need a, re a reliable system, also supported by, by space assets. So now the geopolitical or the, the soft power comes into play. If you're a private owner of such a network and a fleet of your cars is depending on these assets, it is good if they're in one hand. So the, the car company, Tesla and Starlink. So that is a match. But what about Volkswagen? I mean, there are there by articles out in the in the press that Volkswagen is thinking about um, building their own constellation or jumping on uh, on the Starlink constellation with their autonomous fleet. But what does it imply when your competitor owns the platform, and can you can your fleet or or can you can you get can get down your fleet uh, with a fingertip? So how dangerous, how difficult is that? And that's just on the car side. I mean, there are other um, aspects um, in, the, uh, in the equation as well. I mean, that, that led Europe or Terry uh, Breton, the EU commissioner earlier this year to this statement, we need our own independent satellite constellation for Europe. So a um, few may, may argue, oh, we don't need it. We can use another one, but it is, a question of sovereignty. It's a question of why do we have an Ariane or a rocket in, in Europe, even it's so expensive. Yes, we need this independent access to space or because otherwise we are depending. And in Germany, we see it or in the north uh, with the, the entire discussion we have on a geopolitical level with Nord, Nord Stream 2. We see, we see with the pipeline from Russia and the pressure Germany, the German government, and the companies involved get from, from the American side. So is that correct? I would say no, but who am I to, to, to judge on that? But it's, it does not feel right. So um, it's amazing to go from how there, there are so many things that, I mean, definitely I, I, I recommend to all my listeners to go out and especially if they're, and I have quite a few space enthusiasts to go out and listen to your podcasts and, and go to Space Watch and, and the Space Cafe as well. We'll list all those links in the show mm -hmm. notes and descriptions. You kind of tickled upon it uh, as well. So Copia is a, is a UN based project, just like Corsia is a UN based project for air flight, air traffic, mm -hmm. 
and um, carbon. Um, but there are these wonderful things around the, the, the United Nations where nations have started to think about, you know, not just air travel, not just space travel, they're thinking this global bigger picture. Yeah. And yeah, they're slow and, and there's a whole nother plethora of issues there. But there are things already out there, but most of us don't even know about. I bet you um, not even 1% of my listeners would say, oh, I, I didn't, I knew about Copia. And we've got a lot of techies that, that and that, that was kind of a UN instigated thing or, or that it maybe came externally. And then the UN brought the, the nations together as a platform to, to speak about this. Um, that's why it's important. It's almost this education, this awareness, this new phase of, of learning. And that's why uh, the podcasts, the cafes, the things that we do are so vital because it's not always that we get this real time update of collective mm -hmm. intelligence of what's going on in our world, what some of these big stories, a lot of fake news, a lot of uh, misinformation, a lot of uh, just the stuff that doesn't do a lot to to keep your finger on the pulse of where our planet and humanity is going. And so within that, uh, the, there's this other aspect. There's many SDGs or UN awareness that are also tied to, to space in general. And um, I don't know if you can kind of tell us some of the ones that you're working on and what your thoughts are as far as sustainability and resilience and this, you know, reusing, uh, uh, movement that's going on in space, but then even maybe touch or tickle upon all the space junk. I know you have some information about the space junk or some views or people you've you've spoken to about this as well. Well, absolutely. Um, space is supporting or enabling a number of the SDGs that you, you mentioned. I mean, we have 17. There are proposals for even having space as the 18th SDG, are there various activities and initiatives out there to, to bring it to the table? Because we are so heavily depending on it and we have to clarify or we, we have to set our, rule, uh, our rules to yeah, not make a mistake that we will regret sooner or later. Because, I mean, you mentioned this is the space junk or, or um, this is the space debris. Um, we have the situation with the oceans and then it's it's not that extreme but or i mean we over years over over decades we polluted the the oceans and now we surprisingly are see that even the fish that we are catching from the sea has the microplastics and it has an effect in the entire our a circle or on the ocean so also we have these massive islands and i don't know what the size is now are of of garbage which are just there and i mean that is absolutely frightening and we start to do that the same in in space i mean the intention of bringing up a satellite network a satellite constellation to serve the world with with internet i would say that's something we all can understand and say yeah that's that's a great one at, at the end it is a business yeah to make money out of that um and then also with all that making business keeping your your uh, competitors out and and so on and being fast to market and so on and so forth so but the sustainability is, is something what is addressed more and more but it's not heard in my opinion and we advocate or um, uh, we don't have a paywall we don't uh put our our content behind um anything where you have to go and pay for information so we try to make ourselves sdg number four compliant as best as possible that everyone uh, who visits our website can access the same information there are no geo blocking or other methods or that that we use the information is available for everyone and it's very important that everyone can access the same level and make its own mind up that's that's also very important it's not that i'm saying we have the solution for everyone no we offer ideas we offer sources and people have to use their own mind 
to come up with their with their own solutions. And I think one thing is good with space. Space excites people. Space drives innovation. Space is something you get a smile in your face. I mean, it's it starts with this stuff around this is uh, Legos where kids, even adults, are, are having really op big eyes while, while building it and putting it together and, and just having fun with it. And that is great. I mean, we all grew up with whatever depends on the philosophy or Star Wars or, or, uh, or Star Trek. Um, but however, it, it has an impact on us. And the good thing is if we try to solve something for space, it has an effect on Earth. But we should ask ourselves, why don't we solve things on Earth first before doing it in, in space? Or why do we have to use um, something to play wire space to come back? I mean, so many innovations were made for space. We are using day in, day out on Earth. I mean, and it's not Teflon. <laughs> that is one of the, the, the myths that we have. But can food or, or the, the, the heart monitoring uh, for, and so on. And you have huge offices at NASA, at ESA, at, at JAXA that are doing spin outs. So these technologies, these patents are available, you can use them. So and, and to make an, a, a product out of it. And I think that's, that's, that's great. So we have this wealth of knowledge, we just have to use it in, a, in, in the right way. And I mean, the ISS is an self, not self sustaining organism, but they try to reuse as best as they can all the resources they have. Yeah? And that's air, that's, that's water, and, and so on and so forth. And I think, I mean, we are blessed um, living in, in, in Hamburg or in Berlin or in um, many places all around the world with clean air, with, with our, uh, clean air, green, our, um, green environment. So, but we, as, as you know better than I, we are messing it up in big scale. And our, we have to stop talking and take actions. And I think that's, that's very important. And we um, try to foster this dialogue that, that, that goes in, into, this, into this area. So, I mean, n none of us has the resources to say, hey, let's, let's none of us are, are in, in our company has the resources to, to really get things done in a, in a big scale but at least we can foster these ideas and and inspire people to to think in this direction and that's why we do these dialogues that's why we do the podcast that's why we do the daily news reporting or features and and put them out and we hope we we will not give up on that no i'm i'm sure you won't and I, i'm rooting for you i had uh lynn kaiser on the show and did a podcast which just released today you're gonna have him on your show or are already planning uh him um a super guy um also has a little ties to space but his way of production using ai and 3d printing to uh do new rocket boosters new new technologies that can be used on reusable or quickly printed locally um, um, in a very efficient way, which in some respects kind of is taking AI and doing even a twist on biomimicry kind of to get up the right shapes and the right things needed. So I'm excited to, to watch and listen to that. I know you'll have, have a wonderful time. He's also very big in environment and sustainability and this as well. I know you are as well. And so that really leads me to two of my hardest questions for you. We, we've talked a lot about communities and specific um, countries who are dealing with space and like they're all kind of divided in their own regions or conflicts or areas mm -hmm. that they can work in and they're not really guided by any global or universal laws or principles although they they exist or they're there in to some respects but because of other boundaries and divisions or conflicts that they've they're kind of discombobulated so so to say uh, so my my first hard question for you is do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations borders divisions of humanity one from another um 
and this type of thinking of maybe having a, a, a global operating system, one that worked for all of us? You mentioned earlier, uh, I am call myself a proud Berliner. Um, that's, that's correct, I am. But first of all, I'm a European uh, holding a German passport uh, and living in Berlin. Um, and that what is some, that's something that, that makes me absolutely proud and that's something I'm, I'm fight for. I think having a unified, reunified, unified Europe is one of the biggest achievements in the last 70, 80 years that we had on our continent. And I see it with, with high level of concern, all these nationalistic approaches that we see in all countries. It's not something only in Germany. I mean, see Poland, see, see France, see, see Italy, see, you can name on them all. On, yeah. And that's, that's for me concerning. It has for me a lot to do with education. It has to do with solidarity and has to do with yeah where we come from and i mean i can say and i'm, I'm open about it i mean i grew up in east berlin or uh, before the wall came down so and i experienced this, this life there or uh, for over 20 years um so and that that is something i don't want to miss i don't want to or uh, have have back there is no glorification in oh that was so cool and in the east there were some elements that were not bad no doubt yeah and maybe a centralized education system is better than a federal than than we have right now but the greatest asset is that we have a democracy and everybody has a voice so we have nobody who tells us what to think so we we are free individuals free humans will be that forever i don't know i hope we will but we see other trends as well so that is for Europe. I'm not there to say I'm a global citizen. Yes, of course, I'm, I'm part of this world, but at least I, I think I need to bounce somewhere. And that is that is Europe for me. Um, sure, traveling the world, going to the US. Yeah, you feel OK going to Canada. You, you have much better feeling feeling home going Australia, you say, wow, cool. Yeah, I can imagine to, to live here, but roots are somewhere else. So um, I think we, we, we have to, to try to emerge onto this higher level. And I'm, I wouldn't say I'm too old, but I'm not there yet. I'm on the European level. Yeah. And I try to support so solutions that help us are to to become really global citizen but i i fear it's an it's just an illusion or for for us and we we will not see it in our lifetime and making the connect to space if i see or if i hear elon and his ambition to go to mars i say yeah wow that's pretty cool somebody who drives it who drives innovation but when the next sentence is then, yeah, but we will not accept taking our rules from the world to Mars, I start questioning or I'm using or we are using our own currency on, on Mars, which is then Bitcoins or so. That is where I think we have to work on and we have to work on before it's too late. So in the entire dialogue we have for new governance systems on Moon, on Mars. Yeah. These are highly relevant and highly important. Even they're out of out of space for most of us. But if we don't have an agreement on, on governance or on, on the moon, we will take our problems, our our conflicts from Earth just to another place. And might be the moon at in the first instance, may it be Mars later on, or wherever our our destiny will be in the future. And that's not good. You really touch upon something. So you you mentioned Star Trek earlier. Now you're talking about what's the operating system, the governance system, what's the currency um, on the moon or Mars. Um, we don't take the same problems or the same systems from from Earth and, and apply them there. 
in Star Trek, uh, they had their own economics. We call it Trekonomics. So I'm a big Star Trek fan and also Star Wars and all the other uh, uh, space odysseys movies, you know, that showed these sci-fi uh, depictions of the future. Um, Star Trek had its own economy. It's called, it was called Trekonomics. It was one based on, not on monetary system, but um, there was a mi rare mineral that sometimes they talked about that, that, that they needed. But overall, people weren't making uh, a certain wage or credits for the jobs that they did, yet they were engineers and doctors and security and, and on and on, and clear to bartenders, to psychologists, to communications officers. Um, but they weren't making the regular dollar, you know, uh, but yet those were highly sought after positions to be on certain things. And, and there's a whole book written on it. Economics is the name of it, actually. And it's, it's absolutely fabulous. We, this goes back to the question of global citizen and a world without nations, borders, divisions of humanity, one for another. What if we had a a new global operating system for the earth, one that worked for all of humanity, where we raised the bar higher and said, okay, we're never going to let humanity suffer below this level again. No poverty, no hunger, no basic needs, the, the not universal basic income, much different and much higher. And then, yeah, we're gonna still mm -hmm. have problems, but we've just set the bar higher on a global level um, to agree uh, humanity one with another. Being someone, myself and you, who, who think and deal a lot with outer space and Mars and Moon and about the innovations and technologies, um, it, it's really funny because in that respect, if there were aliens, if there was, if we do make it back, uh, uh, or if we do make it to Mars or the Moon, uh, back to the Moon and set up a colony there, Will those people look back at Earth and say, "Boy, look at those crazy guys! They can't even get along together. Yet they're all the same species. Why are they fighting against them?" If, if an alien were to visit our planet, they'd say, "Aren't you guys all the same species? Why are you fighting against each other? What, what's the what's the difference? We don't even have a unifying operating system for our planet." And I think. Um, the, re the, the reason I sparked that question is we're all breathing the same air. We're all drinking the same water. It's all circulated on our planet. The species don't have borders. The COVID and Corona doesn't have any borders. It doesn't stop at the border. Um, and so we're, we're lacking a unified new operating system, in my opinion. I, I think all over the the, the earth, we are seeing this civil unrest. We're seeing a dis-ease at the current operating systems and models and governments and, and, and things that they're just not working for us all anymore. And that's why we see difficulties with inaugurations. We see difficulties with Black Lives Matters. We just, just uh, very recently was in, in Atlanta, the Asians that uh, uh, were, were killed and brutally murdered mm -hmm. because of a racial issue. Uh, uh, in some respects, we haven't evolved too much from the Neanderthal, yet we're talking about space. And so we, we need to get together and unify somehow on a, new, on a new system that works for us all. And that really leads me to my hardest question for you today. And it is the burning question, WTF. And you've heard it before. It's not the swear word. It's really What's your vision? What's your understanding? Of where do you think we're going? What's the future, Torsten? I'm an optimist uh, by heart, sometimes with a pessimistic outfit. And I know that. Uh, but at the moment, I, I do have a hard time to envision a positive future for us if we stay on this track where we are. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm asking most of my guests the same. What would, is their view on our future in space as humans? Are, and the answers are as diverse as you can imagine. Are, so um, we will have a, an, an um, summit in preparation are, where we will discuss a few of the future models that we can envision are in, in space. Are, so. 
from an Elysium type to in, hey, we all go there and, and love each other and are having a good time on, on Mars, Moon and, and wherever. But I think it's, it's not that likely that we will be there. And um, I think we have to radical, and you, you talked about the, the global governance system, we have to make radical changes of our relationship to appropriation of goods, of land, of, 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 of property. I mean, that's what is the base for, for, for our rule set that, that we have in the various countries. And I think that's also the, the base for many of the conflicts on resources, on economic uh, uh, challenges. I mean, that's why we have migrants. It's, it's war or economic drive uh, or climate change or something else that comes, comes into this equation now. So, but with the current system, I don't see where, where that will go. I mean, we have seen earlier this, no, last year, we have seen uh, the um, evolvement of the Artemis Accords and the Artemis project. And when you see that from the outside, you say, wow, yeah, Artemis going back to the moon or uh, with commercials and other countries. But what it, what, what it is for me, and that's how I see it, it's, it's legal in its, in, its, in its structure without any doubt. Um, but I think it's, it's not a good approach because it's one country leading or their way to the moon. Okay, inviting others, but based on their rules, uh, on, on, on their rule set. So, I mean, if you apply to the, to, the, to the Artemis rules, you can be part of that. So, but that's of course exclusive. And that's not the, the spirit that, uh, that we would see from, from the UN or from UNOSA, or the United Nations Office of Outer Space or Space Affairs or, or COPIOS. So, and because these for us are consents driven and yes, it is questionable can we reach consents today on these major topics? Also something where, where we need to put some efforts in. What, we, what bottom line is, our technology is evolving so fast. And it's not just space technology, it's AI. It is uh, all these, uh, it's, it's new algorithms that we see with it. That's quantum technology that we hardly can manage and understand but it and it will sooner or later have its own conscious its own being so and i think then we are in in scenarios that we don't want to see will we experience that i don't know but i mean having a look at uh, to china on their social profiling i don't feel comfortable with with that applying here in europe where we coming from the East, just got our freedom, our liberty to think what we want, to, to say what we want. And I'm not sure that we can answer all these, these fundamental questions. And about aliens, um, I, can, I like to refer to episode number 22 of our podcast. We had Avi Loeb, the Harvard professor in our show, in the podcast. And Avi Loeb is the one who talked about Oumuamua, this object that came from outside our solar system and passed by and went away. And it had a shape very long, very thin and, and, and made shadows. And he said, it could be a starship from a foreign our civilization. And the big question is, why didn't they had a look at us? And he said, are you looking at the ants on the, on the street? No, I mean, who are we that we believe we are the, I mean, the, the, the top of the uh, ev evolu uh, evolution, evolution, or maybe there are other species, other forms of life that are more developed, and they're just ignoring us. And as you say, so looking at us and say, why are those guys fighting? Doesn't make sense, but pff, let's move on. So, and... I think, I mean, I, I don't have answers on, on these questions. And I can tell you it's, it's, it's sometimes, it does not feel good not to have answers, but uh, 
at least we, we, we are driven by the desire and the hunger to find answers, maybe not create answers by our own, but, but hear answers from others, adapt those or, and go in, into a dialogue. And that's our, the mission that we have for us defined. So we want to go out and, and foster this dialogue on, ver on various levels. And so the, the guests that I'm, I'm having are part of that conversation to go out. And it's also to address all these topics, space related to the other 99% which don't have a clue, which don't have an interest for, for them is Star Trek enough or Star Wars enough. But reality, I'm using my cell phone. Why do I need a GPS system? Uh, yeah, because you're using your cell phone. You should be at least aware of it. You don't have to understand how it works. Yeah, you don't have to go into the into the chipset of the computer of a computer to understand what a computer can do for you. And um, but at least raising the awareness for why we spend are, are a few dollars on, on space or in EU or in, in the US, it's, it's very important. I absolutely love that. And it's really about, it's not really about having the answers always, but it's nice to ask the question and kind of wonder, is there a better system or is there an answer and, and kind of listen to all the different positive, whether it's space, whether it's sustainability, whether it's a biodiversity, whether it's business, whether it's uh, innovation, that we're kind of up to speed with the collective mm -hmm. intelligence of humanity, wondering where is the model that we're currently operating on, no matter where we live, what, the model that you know is in Germany, if we push that model out into the future, is that one that will really mm -hmm. take us to the future? Is it a model that's eventually gonna collapse or is not very well, uh, set to get us to the future that we want to be in. So I, I like to just uh, see that you you are thinking about the question that you're honest enough to say you don't have the answers because I, I don't think any of us do. But there are some thought leaders out there that really have ha have some plans, have some done some thinking about it, and and presented different ideas and possibilities. Obviously, one of them is. Uh, uh, is the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, uh, the UN um, um, Accords for Space and Air Travel and other things that have kind of thought about, you know, where are we going? What do we need to have in the future to be prepared? Um, there's the donut economics, there's the, the New Green Deal, there's, you know, there's some things definitely emerging. It's important that, that someone's looking out for that because as you and I well know, we're going to be sorely disappointed if we're waiting for someone else or others to deliver the future for us. It definitely won't be what we want or what we mm -hmm. think we expected. It'll be what they want and what they expected. And, and maybe that, that'll be good for us, but uh, it might not. And so we need to get involved. We need to ask ourselves these questions. I only have three last questions for you uh, before we end this. And they're really for my listeners. Um, the first one is, is there, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners that uh, was a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? I mean, these are the big questions for, for, for wisdom to, to others. Um, I'm not good at that, or to be honest. I mean... What I say, um, if people ask me, hey, what can we do is, is, is be yourself, be open to new ideas. And, and I mean, don't be hard cornered or in your, in your thinking, be, be open. And I mean, moonshots exist. Uh, it's, it's like black swans. I mean, uh, moonshots just sound better. Um, and they exist. You just have to look for them and you have to, yeah, also let them happen or initiate them by yourself. But my message is to each and be, be yourself, be honest, be transparent, and don't try to pretend somebody you are not. I mean, that's on a, on a very personal level, of course, um, because I, I don't see myself to give bigger advice. That's, that's perfectly fine. And, and you're absolutely right. Black swans do exist. 
but also uh, green swans exist. So I got uh, <laughs> cool. John Elkington's book, Green Swans, Ugly Ducklings Exist, uh, Black Swans with Green Feathers or Green Swans with Black Feathers. There's gray swans. Um, I, I, I want us to be aware that, you know, there's, it's, there's, there's not always this gray area. There's not always this black and white. There is a diversity just with like with exponential or the future. There's two sides to that. There's a doom and gloom and negative side. And then there's a very positive side. I think to, to be thinking about the question or to be able to depart to listeners some advice or, or help or ways to look at things differently. And I, and I get that from your show. I get that from your in-depth, wonderful answers you've given me today. But what should young innovators in space and in, in um, space watching and in uh, computer science and space engineering and, and all those mm -hmm. things similar to what you're doing in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to to make a real impact or to, to get in even their foot in the, to the door in this direction so that they can be part of the journey uh, that we're going wherever it is. I mean, first of all, we have to say everybody uh, can find his or her place in the space industry. The space industry is not a place just for tech guys, just for engineers. You need all of them. And we touched on a few points earlier. You need lawyers. You need our, our, our people that, that are, take care about food, food security. You, de, you need medical people. I mean, today, we will not survive a flight to the Mars. We will die on our way. So how to set up a civilization when you're dying on your way? That is, that is, that is hard to imagine. So we have to find answers to that, to that first. So, and how to get into this industry yeah, be, be open. I mean, there's so much going on. Our, our platform is just one element of this wide ocean of information that you can find. Um, as a young uh, citizen, you can uh, um, enter the or, or join the SGAC, the Space Advisory Council. Uh, SGA, Space Generation Advisory Council. So that was missing. A youth organization till 35 or till the age of 35, where you can engage yourself with with one of the bigger programs. You have the ISU mentioned before, the International Space University, and many others. Luxembourg University has programs. Berlin has has a fantastic program on the engineering side for space. I have to say, our Karlsruhe and so on and so forth here in Germany. And then you have these really these these absolute fantastic universities in the states are um, which offering. Uh, great programs for space enthusiasts. So if there is a will, then there is a way. Yeah, and I mean, we are not living in a time where you have where you get when you're born, the blueprint how to how to live your life. So when you go to chapter 18. So what I'm doing this day, that doesn't exist. I mean, find your own way and work and and, and work hard on it. I love it. Thank you very much. What have you learned or experienced in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Persistence. Persistence. I mean, don't give up on your ideas. I mean, it's it's hard to, well, it's easy to find an idea, to run for it, and then also to drop it for whatever reason. That's easy. Uh, but to stay with an idea, to run for it. And I'm, I'm using running here again, or I'm a, not a good one, but I'm at least I was a passionate marathon runner and I've done it a couple of times. Or, and running a marathon for somebody with my stature, our age is, is, is not a pleasure at all. I mean, you train, are for for many months and then you run it and at, at least at kilometer 30 it is her it's it, it's hard and everything hurts and then you're just pushed by the spectators or forward but when you make it that's really awarding i mean all these 
endorphins, whatever it is, something cool happens in your body afterwards and you're, you're flying, you know, you're over the moon. And that's something great. And that only can happen when you're not giving up. And my point is, for me, I adapted marathon changed my life. Marathon running, marathon training changed my life or in, in how I see things, how I deal with things. I mean, you, win, you, you can't win a marathon on the first mile because you're ah, super sporty and you're running fast. No, you have to find your pace and you keep on going. You keep on going. Sure, a wise leadership or advice is sometimes look back if people are still following you, otherwise you're on your own. Um, that is also something what I experienced a few times that uh, at one point you are alone, you ask, hey, or, I, I was just running. Yeah, but a bit too fast for, for the rest. So again, monitor your, yourself. And um, yeah, this wisdom of age or to learn that before, that would be great. And Yes, we all heard it before because our parents told us, our grandparents told us, but we haven't been listened to them because, hey, them, what do they know? They are just old. Yeah? But now we see, hey, yeah, maybe we had listened to them. But that's yeah, just that's on, a, on a side lesson. note. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Torsen. It was wonderful. It was great Thank to have you. you on the episode. And, and I hope we can do a follow up again next year and we'll stay in touch. Um, as we come out of these lockdowns and into the great reset. I really appreciate it. You have a most excellent, wonderful day. Thanks for Thank sharing and letting us in, inside your ideas. Mark, thank you for, for having me.